Today, I'm going to talk about two murdered Jewish journalists, Joseph Selkovich and Peretz Opachinsky, and about their remarkable ghetto reportage. Their writings might have vanished forever, but the writings survived because both Selkovich and Opachinsky worked and organized ghetto archives, archives that encouraged them to write and that hid their manuscripts. Peretz Opachinsky was a member of the secret Oynik Shabbos archive, Joy of the Sabbath archive, organized by the historian Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto. Joseph Selkovich was one of the leaders of the Lodge Ghetto archive. As Rachel Auerbach, a survivor of the Ringelblum archive, uh, commented after the war, these archives had much better luck saving documents than saving people. Of the 60 members of the Oynik Shabbos archive, only three survived. Of the 13 or so staffers of the Lodge archive, only one. Peretz Opachinsky was probably murdered in Treblinka in January 1943, along with his wife and son. Joseph Selkovich and his family were killed in Auschwitz in August 1944 during the final liquidation of the Lodge ghetto. These writings are important for many reasons. One of those reasons goes to the question, who will write our history? That's the title I chose for my book on Emanuel Ringelblum. The Germans thought that they would win the war and that they would write the history of the Jews, the Jews that they'd killed. As the historian Isaac Schipper told a friend in Majdanek in 1943, just before Schipper himself was murdered, what we know about murdered peoples is only what their killers vaingloriously care to say about them. Should our killers be victorious? Should the Germans write the history of this war? Our destruction will be presented as one of the most beautiful pages of world history. And future generations will pay tribute to the Germans as dauntless crusaders. Their every word will be taken as gospel or the Germans might choose to wipe out our memory altogether, as if we'd never existed, as if there'd never been a Polish Jewry. But Jews in the ghettos, like these writers in the secret ghetto archives, did all they could to ensure that even if they themselves died, those time capsules of documents that they buried would protect the memory of Polish Jewry and allow future Jew, uh, uh, historians to write its history. Their writings, they hope, would mean that Jews would be remembered as individuals and not as faceless, passive victims. The ghetto archives in Lodge and Warsaw encourage many different kinds of writing, diaries, essays, poetry, one of the most important genres was reportage, artfully narrated, factually truthful description of the microcosms of ghetto life. Before the war, reportage was a mainstay of the Polish Jewish press, a virtual travelogue or roadmap that deciphered the tumultuous diversity of Polish Jewry, three and a half million strong. Shtetl dwellers wanted to know what was happening in the city and vice versa for urban Jews. Everybody loved to read gossip about Hasidic rebbies or prominent politicians. Jews were especially eager to know about the inner contours of the city, the milieu of specific streets, the exotic secret world of the Jewish teamsters, porters, and butchers. They also wanted to know about the Poles, those neighbors whom they saw in the streets, but hardly ever in their homes. And every self-respecting Yiddish newspaper also had its own court reporter who somehow retrieved inside scoops from the police blotter. Before the war, journalists like Opachinsky and Zelkovich knew the people that they were writing for. Uh, the fractious, argumentative, opinionated Polish Jews who read the morning Yiddish newspapers. The Yiddish language itself often reviled increasingly on the defensive in Poland in the 1930s, fighting the growing acculturation uh, 
That very Yiddish language forged a bond between these writers and their readers. If before the war, Opachinsky and Zelkovich knew their audience, in the ghetto, they were forced to write as if, as if, Rachel Auerbach recalled, their articles would as if appear in the morning paper. Only this as if could justify the decision to write at the edge of the abyss. Opachinsky and Zelkovich used their brilliant reportage to decode ghetto life, and they described a cast of characters that ran the gamut from rabbis to prostitutes and crooks. Their reportage explored the nooks and crannies of everyday life in real time. They themselves were just as ignorant of the future as the Jews they were writing about. They were writing about a Jewish community that was in crisis but was not yet destroyed. Their Jews were still individuals with names and with identity and moral agency. Opachinsky and Zolkovich judged their fellow Jews and called them to account, both as individuals and as a community. At the same time, Zelkovich and Opachinsky depicted many moments of quiet heroism as Jews, racked by disease and starvation, fought to keep their dignity and to hang on. Writing fact, not fiction, Zelkovich and Opachinsky touched all the registers of Yiddish speech and mined the rich resources of Yiddish literary illusion in order to provoke, shock, preach, and even entertain. Documents were not enough. One needed reportage to elicit the emotional nuance behind the bare facts, to make individuals come alive in their own voice, and to gather facts to bring the killers to post-war justice. These writings from Warsaw and Lodz, from those ghettos, remind us of a distinction that is often forgotten today, a distinction between ghettos and concentration camps. Today, we sometimes think of ghettos as mere antechambers to the camps, holding pens for the condemned. But that's knowledge after the fact, and it's not true. Samuel uh, Gringaus, who survived the Kovna ghetto and Dachau, stressed that his ghetto was, quote, a form of Jewish national and autonomous concentration. It was a Jewish community that was battered, but not yet destroyed. It was marked not only by understandable pathologies, but also by important continuities with pre-war Jewish culture and values. That said, as these ghetto writings remind us, no two ghettos were alike, and there were enormous differences between the Ludge and Warsaw ghettos compared to the Ludge ghetto. The Warsaw ghetto had a great deal more social space. In Warsaw, there was a large alternative community uh, opposed to the Judenrat and the Jewish police, a community based on 1,100 house committees. In Lodz, the ghetto was much more regimented. And while Warsaw was in the general gouvernement, the German name for occupied central Poland, Lodz had been annexed to the German Reich. In Warsaw, there was an Aryan side inhabited by Poles who didn't particularly like Jews, but who hated the Germans and who were ready to trade. In Warsaw, massive smuggling provided about 90% of the food consumed in the ghetto, food paid for by a huge degree of illegal trade between Poles and Jews. In large things were totally different. The ghetto was sealed off. There was no smuggling. The only mo money was ghetto scrip, useless outside. Food was what the Germans allowed in. The way food was distributed enormously increased the power of ghetto boss Chaim Rumkowski and later the power of other German favorites. And in Lodz, there was no Aryan side. The Aryans in Lodz were largely Volksdeutsche, uh, self-proclaimed Germans. In Warsaw, at one point, there were up to 15,000 Jews hiding on the Aryan side, although most were eventually killed. In Lodz, you could 
count the Jews hiding on the Aryan side on the fingers of two hands. So that was a great difference in the reportage of Opachinsky and Zelkovich. What Opachinsky wrote about, smuggling, poles in the ghetto, house committees, this was totally absent from Zelkovich's, uh, from Zelkovich's reportage. Peretz Opachinsky was born in 1892 to a very religious family in Lutomirs near Lodz. His father, Eger Hossi, died when he was only five. Family poverty forced him to leave home to study in different yeshivas, sleep on synagogue benches, and eat in strangers' homes. His mothers and sisters wanted him to be a rabbi, but he shocked them and became a shoemaker. In those turbulent and heady times just before 1914, Opachinsky found a new passion, Hebrew and Yiddish literature. Yitzhak Lamed Peretz and Shin Ansky were calling for a new modern Yiddish secular culture that would transform the Jewish people by reintegrating Jewish folk tradition with the best ideals of the European Enlightenment. For young Jews like Opachinsky, Yiddish literature and theater opened up a new world. It raised high hopes. It offered new horizons. On the walls of his room, he hung pictures of the two great Yiddish classical writers, Shalom Aleichem and Weil Peretz. In World War I, he was uh, drafted into the Russian army. He was captured. And then he spent four years in an Austrian uh, prison camp. After the war, he settled in Lodz, married, and became active in Yiddish literary circles. A good friend of his was the well-known religious uh, poetess Miriam Ul Ulidover. He also joined the Wright Labor Zionists, the Wright uh, Poetium. In 1935, his two children became sick and died. Deeply depressed, he moved to Warsaw and edited the party's newspaper, Dosnaya Vort. The Wright Poilitzion, the Wright Labor Zionists, was a big tent party. It combined Zionism with diaspora populism, and it embraced both Hebrew and Yiddish. And just as Opachinsky revered Joseph Chaim Brenner, one of the giants of modern Hebrew literature, he also venerated the Yiddish master Sholem Aleichem. Opachinsky's politics owed as much to populist instinct as to ideology. And you could see this in a revealing pre-war article that he wrote on Shalom Aleichem's great character, Tevye Dalmichigev, Tevye the Dairyman. Jewish politicians and leaders, Opachinsky said, had much to learn from Tevye, from Tevye's integrity, his respect for both religious and secular sources, Derech Eretz Farn Sefer und Farn Buch in Yiddish, for Tevye's faith in ultimate justice, Yoisher, his faith in honest human labor. Opachinsky lambasted facile leftist ideologues who used Tevye as a political foil. Tevye was the quintessential Jew, the symbol of the Jewish everyman. He was guided by innate Jewish pride and a strong sense of Jewish self. Tevye did not need intellectuals to tell him how to live. In 1938, Opachinsky's sister Rena visited from the United States, and she left a valuable memoir about her brother. She was shocked by what she saw. He lived in terrible poverty on Volinska 21, in the middle of a wretched slum. He refused to take money from her. He sought no fame or recognition, and indeed got little. Opachinsky saw writing as a sacred mission. He saw it as a calling and not as a career. But there was also good news. Opachinsky and his wife rejoiced at the birth of their new son, Danchik. And as his sister recalls, he doted on the child and showed him off at every opportunity. Uh, it, in the Warsaw Ghetto, Opachinsky got a job as a ghetto mailman, but the pay was miserable. Survivors remembered Opachinsky in the ghetto. He was frail, tired, with feet swollen from hunger, but he refused to despair. He remained an active party member, and he was a community activist. He was also a leader in his house committee on Volinska 21. The Yonik Shabbos archive recruited him, helped him with small stipends, and secured medicine to help him survive 
a bout of typhus. Conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto changed very quickly, always for the worst. Ringelblum encouraged members of the Oynik Shabbos, therefore, to describe what they saw immediately, not to wait. No day was like the preceding day. Images succeeded one another with cinematic speed. And what seemed important today might be totally forgotten tomorrow. So it was important to capture at once, in real time, every event in Jewish life in its pristine freshness to give future historians some understanding of ghetto time. And few writers were better than Opachinsky at capturing events as they happened. Thanks to the Oynik Shabbos, Opachinsky opened a window onto a community that was battered but still alive, reeling but not yet destroyed. In his masterly reportage, The Ghetto Mailman, he described the diverse mosaic of Jewish Warsaw. Polish-speaking doctors, Hasidim, ordinary workers, housewives, destitute refugees. Like Sholem Aleichem, whose style influenced him a great deal, Opachinsky made masterful use of irony. Before the war in anti-Semitic Poland, there had been no mailmen, there had been no Jewish police, and now the ghetto had both. Surely a sign of Jewish autonomy. My God, we've lived to see Jewish policemen and Jewish mailmen. They even have uniforms. Shabby, of course, no epaulets or swords, but still, uniforms. Jews envied him his job and offered bribes if he could help him get hired. If he could help them get hired, Opachinsky skewered their delusions. Irony gave way to reality. What those jealous Jews did not know was that if he delivered 150 letters a day, a remarkable feat, he might earn nine zlotys barely enough to buy half a loaf of bread. Nothing in the ghetto was normal, and the seemingly mundane job of mailman morphed into a searing chronicle of the ghetto every day, of raised hopes and bleak despair. In one moment, the mailman was a beacon of joy, bringing a letter from America or a package of food from the Russian-occupied zone. The next moment, he was climbing the rotting stairs of a death house, a refugee center where Jews lay in bed all day and slowly starved to death. Here he faced harrowing moral choices. If he handed over a letter without collecting the 20 cent fee, the money would have to come out of his own pocket. If he refused to deliver the letter, a desperate Jewish family cursed him as a callous brute a Judenrat thug. Indeed, that little detail, the 20 cent fee, exposed the churlish obtuseness of a Judenrat that taxed rich and poor at the same rate. But on the other hand, what other way did the Judenrat have to raise money? Could it demand tax returns? Could it, uh, could it levy an income tax? We see how the Germans forced everybody into a moral trap. Opachinsky, the mailman, also dissected the wide social and cultural gaps in the ghetto, gaps between Polish-Jewish professionals who addressed him with arrogant contempt and exposed their own inferiority complexes. And then there were the Hasidim. The Hasidim, he wrote, were no better. They were hypocritical misers who begrudged him a measly tip. The only Jews who treated him decently were Amcha the ordinary people, unpretentious people, who spoke Yiddish and who related to him with empathy. They were the ones who gave him decent tips, at least in the beginning. Opachinsky was a staunch populist. He was a strong believer in the essential decency of the common man. Incredibly, his reportage shows that this optimistic populism even embraced ordinary German soldiers and Poles. Many German soldiers came to visit the ghetto because, in his words, they were decent, ordinary folk, ehrliche Volksmenschen. They were workers and peasants who had no interest in Hitler's ideology. They would come to the Jewish street markets and talk to the Jewish traders in a combination of Yiddish and German. 
like common people everywhere, they began to feel comfortable with one another and even began to say what they thought of Hitler and his gang. At least this is what Opachinsky wrote. Some of Opachinsky's most significant reportage described the smuggling that he believed proved once again that Poles and Jews did not have to love each other in order to understand that they shared common interests. He writes, smuggling certainly is a filthy business, but who knows? Someday we might have to construct a memorial to the courage of the smugglers who saved a good part of Jewish Warsaw from starving to death. If you're looking for some higher value to this buying and selling, then you could find it only in the bridge that has appeared between the Jew and the Gentile. It's a bridge built out of bad material, speculation, but it has a good purpose, to keep a large part of the Jewish population from starving to death. In the Yiddish writer Shalomash's story, Kola Street, written in 1906, the wealthy Jews of the shtetl are sneering at the lowly uh, tough guys, at the brawny porters and teamsters who live in Kola Street, a low rent district. But when danger threatens, it's those tough Jews who defend the shtetl from harm. So too in the Warsaw Ghetto, Hundreds of thousands of Pachinsky believed owed their lives to the smugglers, many of whom came from the famed Warsaw Jewish underworld. Yet precisely because wartime encouraged the basest human passions, it was doubly important, Pachinsky believed, for Jews to show concern and civic responsibility. The German occupation did not relieve Jews of their agency, of their moral responsibility to help each other. And in hard-hitting reportage, like Children on the Pavement, he excoriated the community as a whole. Polish Jewry, he blamed for its failure to save starving Jewish children who were begging in the streets and dying in uh, droves. And I quote now, he's writing, all sense of community began and ended with the four walls of one's own apartment. It is the tragedy of the Polish Jews that war found them so unprepared, so unorganized, so incapable of, riving, of rising to the needs of the times. Polish Jewry was divided, he writes, into thousands of separate tribes, Adis, and each person was a tribe unto himself. And this shows us something else, how anger at other Jews was a hallmark of wartime writing that you don't see in post-war writing. Here is nowhere else in his writing, Opachinsky demanded a moral accounting in justice. Having lost two children of his own, he had no time for excuses. Jews had to do more to save their children. The beginning of the deportations in 1942 drew Opachinsky into a crisis. The destruction of Warsaw Jewry meant the murder of the children, the destruction of the color, colorful characters in the courtyards, the end of the smugglers, of the Yiddish language itself. And he now directed his attention to his diary. The facility that had marked his ghetto reportage now gave way to words of helpless rage and genuine puzzlement. On September 4th, he reported the rumors that the Germans actually intended to wipe out all the Jews of Europe. And he writes, our end has come. This is the thought that's on everybody's mind. We're facing annihilation and nobody has the courage to lead a resistance so that we would at least die with honor. On September 8th, he described the bedlam in the so-called cauldron where all the remaining Jews had to gather in a small area for a final registration and selection. The impression left by this registration was terrible. And for Opachinsky, it was symbolized by one and two-year-old children sitting on a sofa in the middle of the street and crying, Mama, while Jews, their hearts bleeding, were passing by, watching the horrible scene and crying. And he writes, the Germans have probably done it uh, deliberately. They could have taken the children away, but 
they did not. On the contrary, let the Jews see it and let them suffer just a little bit more. In the last moments of his life, Opachinsky kept returning to the theme of resistance and its anger that there was no resistance in Warsaw, or so he thought. He was unaware of the ZOB, the Jewish Fighting Organization. He was unaware of the preparations for armed struggle. But even in his deepening despair, Opachinsky amazingly held down to his belief in the fundamental decency of ordinary Germans. He wrote, the Gestapo spread rumors that uh, the Jews were working in the East. They spread those rumors, not just to fool Jews, but even more to fool ordinary German soldiers who would, quote unquote, tremble in horror or even revolt if the truth about the death camps became known to them, or that's what Opachinsky believed. And perhaps this frantic holding on to his faith in basic humanism was now the only thing he had left. The last diary entry is dated January 5th, 1943. Uh, and he probably died in the roundups in the ghetto that took place in mid-January. Nothing is known about the fate of his wife Miriam or son Doncic, uh, but they were probably killed in uh, Treblinka. Joseph Zelkovich, who was born in 1897 and died in Auschwitz in 1944, was born and grew up in a small town near Lodz into a well-to-do Hasidic family, and he got a traditional religious education. But Zelkovich also learned Polish, and he left the religious world. He went to study at the University of Berlin, where he developed a keen interest in German literature. After a stint in the Polish army, Zelkovich became a Yiddish journalist in Lodz, and he also became an active member of the radical Marxist Yiddishist Linke Poilitzion, left labor Zionists. He helped found the large branch of the Evo, the Yiddish Scientific Institute, and he became a serious scholar of Jewish ethnography and folklore. Working with the historian Philip Friedman, he researched local history, the folklore and Yiddish speech of the Lodge region. Zelkovich was active in the Yiddish cultural life of the Lodge ghetto. He collaborated with the popular composer David Beethoven on musical and theatrical productions, and he was part of Miriam Ulinover's literary circle. His key role, however, was in the semi-clandestine, semi-official Lodge ghetto archive, where he helped edit the enormous Lodge ghetto chronicle, as well as the ghetto encyclopedia. Like Ringelblum's Oynik Shabbos, these projects, especially the ghetto encyclopedia, reflected the Yivo ethos of engaged scholarship. But unlike the Oynik Shabbos archive in the Warsaw ghetto, the large ghetto archive was an official part of the ghetto administration. Rumkowski knew about it, and therefore Zelkovich and his collaborators had to be more circumspect especially concerning direct criticism of Rumkowski himself. But criticize he did. He criticized corruption, protectionism. He criticized the punishments that fell on the poor and that spared the privileged inner circle. Other reportage described the human tragedies behind the laconic monthly reports of the ghetto's welfare department. Zelkovich and a co-worker, an assimilated, educated woman named Riva Bromson, interviewed poor Jews who had applied for welfare assistance. Zelkovich clearly modeled these so-called apartment reportages on the Yiddish writer Yudlamid Peretz's 1891 impressions of a journey through the Tomashev region, where parrots had gone, pencil and paper in hand, to interview poverty-stricken Jews in shtetls near Lublin. This was based on a real mission funded by the millionaire Jan Bloch to gather data in shtetls to help improve the lot of poor Jews. Parrots, the narrator, was an enlightened Europeanized urban Jew 
who would collect statistics and perhaps encourage the benighted shtetl Jews to take some small steps to better themselves. Yet his very first encounter sparked feelings of emotional turmoil and confusion. Although the Jews in the shtetl lacked a university education, they were not stupid. In their provincial Yiddish, heavily larded with phrases from traditional texts, they mocked the narrators, Peretz's interest in statistics. They questioned his motives. They asked questions that he could not answer. They raised objections that he could not refute. Peretz begins to question the whole purpose of his mission, his own assumptions of cultural superiority. In a time of growing anti-Semitism, rising Polish nationalism, and waning faith in liberalism, we're talking about the 1890s, who is he to promise these shtetl Jews a better future? And at the same time, Peretz, the narrator, could not take refuge in romantic delusions about the supposed vitality and vibrancy of shtetl culture and traditional Judaism. Thus, did a routine trip to the provinces in 1891 turn into a journey into the soul of the modern Jew, who'd lost not only his religion, but was also losing his faith in progress and uh, humanist concord. So like Peretz's narrator, uh, Zelkovich too uh, felt feelings of uh, dismay and self-doubt as he uh, described filthy apartments and shattered families, proud heads of families on the brink of collapse, religious Jews who'd lost their faith, married couples now set against each other. In this time of shipwreck and calamity, what was it that he, an educated Jewish intellectual, had to offer, aside from a wretched welfare payment? That disorientation is reflected in Zelkovich's multi-layered and revealingly frank narrative approach by including in the narrative Riva Bromson, a highly educated, acculturated Jewish woman with little knowledge of Yiddish, who's accompanying him on his interviews. Zolkovich can describe each visit in different registers. One, his first reaction. Two, translating for Bromson. Three, how the ghetto Jews related to him. Zolkovich was shocked to see that many regarded him, the Yiddishist progressive leftist, as nothing more than a Judenrat hack. As one desperate Jew blurted out, they'll hang you Judenrat functionaries, all in groups of 25, hang you from the ghetto bridges, as if they were from shop windows. Selkovich and Bramson had literally gagged on the terrible stench of heaps of rotting vegetables that this Jew and his one surviving child were eating. Selkovich's health warnings did not impress him. To you, it's junk, it's crap, it stinks. But for people like us who live like dogs and root like pigs, for us, buddy, this is food. Our sort of people, sir, are not pigs. Human beings like us, we eat everything. Another dimension in these narratives is Zelkovich's ongoing self examination, his own attempt to make sense of what he was seeing, his shock that so many of his first impressions turned out to be dead wrong. In the grotesque ghetto world, his instincts and common sense no longer served as reliable guides. And in one room, he sees a couple in bed together. He assumes that they're man and wife, who, for lack of anything better to do, had spent the empty days making love. He described what he understood as sexual passion with a frankness quite rare in Yiddish writing, acknowledging his own uh, prurient interests in their goings on, and telling Bromson to look, to overcome her prudish shame and quote unquote, take a closer look at him and her lying in a single bed and looking as if they spent last night in stormy passion, completely exhausted and satisfied with no further need for each other. 
But Selkovich had completely misread the situation. He had not stumbled on two adults lost in sexual pleasure. He came upon a loving father sharing his bed with one sick daughter because the other daughter was affected with TB and had to sleep alone. The wife, the girl's mother, had died four years earlier. And now he writes, no, Reva Bromson, don't curse me now. Don't sling the truth at me, the truth you want to yell. Don't throw it right in my face. You see how I'm burning with shame. I'm ashamed of myself. As far as our conversation on the subject of shame, Riva, please forget all about it. It was through Riva Bromson that Selkovich addressed future readers who might be acculturated Jews or even non-Jews, readers in the future. For how else could individuals who'd never been in the ghetto understand what it was like? On her own, Without Azelkovich to explain and translate, Riva Bromson was caught in the trap of her own European sensibility, unable to look beneath the surface, unwilling to show empathy, to understand what lay behind the squalor. She had to realize, he told her, that the ghetto was a complicated place, a place where mere facts did not tell the whole story. After all, Zolkovich himself had learned not to trust his first impressions. As he writes in words perhaps half addressed to himself, and now I'm quoting again, get rid of those rose-colored glasses, Riva, and start looking at the world with the eyes of a real human being, a mensch. And don't stop there, Riva. Teach your eyes that in the ghetto it's never enough to examine things from a realistic, factual point of view. Looking, even seeing, isn't enough. Here your eyes have to be taught to get to the bottom of things, or as the saying goes, to read between the lines. In the first nine months of 1942, 56,000 Jews were deported from the Ludge Ghetto including all the welfare cases that Selkovich had interviewed. And then after a short lull, disaster struck. On September 1st, 1942, the Germans told Rumkowski to deport all children under 10, all adults over 65. They told them to deport all weak and sickly people, and they gave them a quota of 20,000 to be sent out of the ghetto. The families of ghetto functionaries and of the Jewish police were exempt. On September 4th, a weeping Rumkowski told the Jews in the ghetto that there, were, that there was no choice. They had to hand over their children. Selkovich noted that Rumkowski's tears, Rumkowski was crying, were, quote, not feigned. They were Jewish tears, the outpouring of a Jewish heart. On Saturday, September 5th, the Germans ordered a Geishpera, a total lockdown until further notice. Everybody had to stay inside in their room as the Germans and the Jewish police went room to room, snatching children from their frantic parents. What happened next was the subject of Zelkovich's In Those Terrible Days, quite different from the welfare reportages. In the welfare and the apartment reportages, the subject was desperate poverty, not mass murder. And Zelkovich could write as a reporter, as a ghetto official, as a collector of data, collecting important material for future historians and ethnographers. The Geishpera, the lockdown, was something entirely different. Now he was confronting something entirely, totally unprecedented. He was watching the slow unfolding of palpable horror from the inside in real time, and he himself was in danger. On the second day of the lockdown, the Germans shoved the Jewish police aside and took over the selections themselves. People were sent to their deaths on pure whim. Now I'm quoting Selkovich again. 
The whole time you stood there, lined up in the courtyard, trembling in your petrified trance, you lost all sense that you have a child, a wife, a heart, a brain. Your head is held in a sturdy vice. Your neck is surrounded by a coarse noose. and Heavy stones weigh upon your heart. The uh, daring, the, the dearest person to you, the dearest in the world, could be shot down in your arms. Your own child can be ripped away from you together with a chunk of your own breast, and you, you stand there deaf and dumb. You stand there in narcotic torpor. You won't move a single nerve or show even the slightest touch of a reaction." End of quote. Far from being now a sagacious narrator or an inquisitive reporter, Zolkovich is now peering directly into a monstrous horror that he had to struggle to understand. Making his account so effective is, among other things, his use of time, a minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour record of how the Jews in the ghetto came to realize what was about to happen to them. Selkovich makes palpable and real the terror of Jewish parents living through the mornings, afternoons, and nights when they knew that they would soon lose their children. As death crept closer, they held their children tighter and counted the minutes before the Germans would come to take the kids away forever. They were frantic. They were totally helpless. There was absolutely nothing they could do but wait. In the moments that remained, they hugged their children. They gave them the last of their food. But they were trapped. Escalating fear and horror were measured by the slow ascent and descent of the sun. And now I quote again. Today, however, how many years of their lives would people gladly have given up if they could just keep the sun from setting once more? Today, where is the Joshua who will cry out, sun, stand still in the ghetto? End of quote. Each passing hour saw wild swings in the mood of the ghetto, as everyone sought some weak read of assurance, some rumor in vain. Selkovich's account of the final deportation in those terrible days uh, uh, brilliantly combines striking images of the collective with heartbreaking vignettes of particular victims. When he's writing about the collective, and here I quote, people are screaming, their cries are terrifying, they're dreadful, pointless, just as terrifying and dreadful and pointless as the action that is the direct cause of those laments. The ghetto is no longer simply frozen in fear. Now with twists and convulsions, the whole ghetto has become one huge monstrous spasm, leaping out of its own skin and then falling back upon the barbed wire." End of quote. On the level of the individual, he tells a story of a seven-year-old boy, Rishik Fine, a precocious, sparkling little kid who'd become the darling of the entire uh, courtyard. And now I quote again. No neighbor, whether male or female, no stranger, would pass little Rishek without giving him a pat on his clever little head. And since Rishek Fine was one of those children who belonged not just to their parents, but to the entire building, none of the neighbors was able to look on after the Germans took Rishek away to see how Rishek's father was smashing his head against the wall in wild despair, and no one was there to hear how Rishik's mother shrieked out her dreadful pain. There was another German-speaking mother, she never let on that she knew Yiddish, who went insane after they took away her daughter, uh, Putsi. In her grief, the woman began to shout uh, Perele, her Yiddish name, instead of Putsi. The doctor's diagnosis was that she was suffering from a fit of insanity. 
Was the evidence behind this diagnosis that a Jewish mother was crying out in Yiddish from her Jewish heart? Throughout his report on these unspeakable events, Selkovich continued to show some degree of sympathy or empathy for Rumkowski. At first, he lambasted the Jewish police and the so-called porters of the white guard of the uh, privileged Jews who brought in food. These porters helped in the deportations in exchange for the exemption of their own children and the police as well. But a few pages later, Zolkovich struck a different tone. The Jewish police had a dirty job, he said, but at least they showed more humanity than the Germans. Why did Zolkovich moderate, if ever so slightly, his attacks on Jews who helped deport other people's children in order to save their own? Why did he treat Runkowski with a certain degree of restraint, even with some sympathy. Some scholars have argued that he was only practicing self-censorship, but this is unconvincing. The fact is that Zelkovich, like most of his fellow Jews in the large ghetto, saw no alternative to Rumkowski's course of action. In fact, a, a fact that only intensified their horror, their sense of being trapped. Nowhere in those terrible days, this reportage, is there a call for resistance? Zelkovich does not drop even the slightest hint that Rumkowski should have refused German orders or that Jewish parents should have attacked the Germans with hammers and sticks. With a knife at their throats, the Jews saw that Rumkowski's strategy, buying time with Jewish labor, they saw that strategy as their only option. It was for the same reason that Zolkovich tempter, uh, uh, tempered his condemnation of the Jewish police. If one ruled out resistance and suicide, what was left? This was truly a time, to quote the uh, scholar Lawrence Langer, this was a time of choiceless choices. Rumkowski told his ghetto critics that he would continue to do what was necessary to save at least a remnant. After the war, he would accept the verdict of a Jewish court. Did anyone have a better alternative to offer? When he gave members of underground political parties, when Rukowski gave these leaders of underground parties the chance to save their own comrades from deportation, did they not do so without hesitation, even though they knew that to save a friend meant that another Jew would have to take his place? After the nightmare of the lockdown, and during the ghetto's almost two-year respite, the battlefronts of the war moved closer and closer. By July 1944, the Russians had reached the Vistula, only 60 miles away. At night, the Jews of Lodz could hear the distant thump of heavy artillery. But then came the end. Hans Bibov, the German ghetto commissar had assured the Jews that they would be leaving the ghetto for work in the Reich, but the trains took them instead to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And that's where Zelkovich perished in the gas chambers. Since the end of the war, Opachinsky, Zelkovich, and the other members of the ghetto archives have been largely forgotten. Jewish collective memory preferred to focus on the heroic images of armed struggle or on the religious pathos of mass martyrdom. The real life of the ghettos, with its many negative as well as positive aspects, was less convenient to remember, less interesting, more disturbing. These extraordinary writers have failed to win the attention that they deserve. Now, after so many years, we have a chance to right that wrong. Thank you.